Hello everyone and welcome to another Recommends video. In this video we will be continuing with the book The Abyssal Plane, The Relay Cycle and this will be the fourth and final story in that book. This story is called The Great Beast and it was written by Rich Hawkins. There will be a link to the playlist that contains the first three stories of this book at the end of the video. Unlike the first three stories that mainly took place in the US, this one takes place in England. Before we continue, if you haven't subscribed, I'd like you to consider doing so. So give us a like, drop us a comment, and now the great beast. The congregation of the church was inside and the doors were barricaded and locked. And there was almost three dozen of them in there. You could hear screams coming from outside the church in the rest of the village. Josiah was sitting next to his father in one of the pews trying to help him. The Reverend Linwood was trying to keep the spirits of the people up when the stained glass windows broke and the squids came in. The largest was about four meters tall and wide while the smallest was about the size of a large dog. The squids quickly began feeding on the congregation. They were ripping the people's faces off, ripping their limbs off, stripping away skin and flesh. Josiah had gotten knocked down but when he looked up he saw a large squid that was holding a man, it stuffed the man's head into its mouth and popped his skull and sucked out his brain and then when it was finished it ripped open his chest cavity and began eating his internal organs. He next watched as two squids cornered the Reverend Linwood and then ripped him apart. He looked around and found his father and grabbed his hands, held him to his feet and began leading him through the bodies but then a large squid swooped down and grabbed his father, ripping him out of his hands. So Josiah ran. He made it through the door to the bell tower while saying him sorry to his father. He got the door closed and using a cigarette lighter for light, he climbed up to the top of the tower. As he prayed, he watched the squid come out of the trees, break into the houses, then he would hear the victims inside begin to scream. He was watching the end of the world. The day was overcast and Josiah was out scavenging and hunting for food. He had a crowbar for protection and an LED head torch for light in the dark rooms that he would go into. He went into a pub, turned on his headlight, and began looking around to see what he could find. He searched all the jackets and handbags that he found in the pub, and all he found was a cigarette lighter and a few sticks of spearmint chewing gum. Behind the bar, he found two packets of salted crisps and a bottle of rum that he took a couple of mouthfuls from. When he went back out it was raining and ash was falling with the rain. When the ash stopped falling and the rain washed it away. He kept heading down the street. Each scavenging trip took him further and further away from his hiding place. All of the supermarkets and food stores that he passed were all either looted or burnt. And he didn't go into most of the houses that he passed because they all smelt of ammonia. He hadn't come across another survivor in months. He only had another hour or two before the sun went down and he needed to be back to his hiding place before then because that's when the squids came out. He came across a building site that had a fence around the entire property. He managed to squeeze through the fence underground and went in. There were six houses in there and a porter cabin. He went through all the six houses and found nothing but in the porter cabin he found a Ritz cheese crackers and some beef jerky. He grabbed them and left and squeezed back under the fence and as he's walking a pack of dogs emerged from the shadows between two houses and they saw him. They were mangy and half starved and they began growling and coming towards him. There was nine of them and they began spreading out to flank him. He shouted at them but they kept coming. He waved his crowbar at them, hoping to deter them, but they didn't stop. So he turned and ran down a side street with the dogs chasing after him. As he ran, he tried throwing bins in their way to slow them down. When he looked back, they were closing in on him. As he ran into a graveyard, he fell down and lost his hold hole that he was carrying his beef jerky in. By the time he noticed and looked back, the dogs had ripped it open and were going at the cheese crackers and the beef jerky but he still had the bottle of rum and the packets of crisp in his coat and he was alive. So he ran while they were finishing their meal. 
he headed for the industrial estate on the east side of town. There, he used some keys to open up a side door of a warehouse and went in. He headed for the storeroom in the back that was his hideout. He took off his wet clothes, and then he added the two packets of crisps to his supplies that included four large bottles of water. He changed into some dry clothes and sat there waiting while drinking some rum, watching to see if this would be the night that the squid came for him. He had nightmares as he slept of the drowning of billions, the screams of tortured voices, and the form of Cthulhu rising from the deep to conquer the world. He woke up the next day with the memories of the nightmares, drank some water, and went out. The rain was still falling. He smoked a cigarette. He only had three left. He then pulled on his waterproof coat, grabbed his rucksack and his crowbar, and headed into town. The first place he stopped at was a news agent and looked around, but he left when he saw a rotting body. The next place he went into was a house that looked intact. He went upstairs and in the bathroom found a jar of vitamins and some antiseptic cream. As he was about to leave, he heard voices, so he carefully looked out the window and he saw a dozen men, shabby and dripping. They were armed with knives and they seemed to be looking for someone. The men split up and headed into different directions, and one man headed into the house that he was in. The man was already downstairs looking around. He heard the man coming upstairs, so he hid behind a large wardrobe that was to the left of the doorway. He was scared because he had survived by running and hiding, not fighting. The man came into the room that he was in, and as he began to walk towards him, you heard loud voices outside the house that was hooping and hollering, so he turned around and left. The man had stunk badly, and he smelled of feces. He went over to the window and looked out. There was a man in a green waterproof coat that was running for his life. While the men was chasing him, two of them sprinted and closed the distance, and the man tried to fight them with his hatchet, but he missed, and they jumped him, and began stabbing him with their knives. They surrounded him, opened his coat, and then went to work on him with their knives. He waited until the men were gone, and then left the house cautiously, and headed down the alley towards the location of his hideout. Then he heard voices coming from an adjacent street, so he peered around the corner. He saw one of the men struggling to apprehend a teenage boy and a little girl. He was dragging them by the hand, and they were struggling to escape him. The boy struggled and tried to kick him, but he fell and hit his head, and the girl crouched beside him, and the man pulled out his knife. He threatened to cut their bits off if they don't get moving. Josiah snuck up behind him and hit him in the back of the head with his crowbar, knocking him out. And while the children looked at him, he said, My name is Josiah. Let me help you. The kids didn't trust him, but they followed him back to the warehouse. Once they were inside the warehouse and in his storeroom, the boy thanked him for helping them and then asked if he's not with the cult. And Josiah said, no, he's just a survivor. He cooked two cans of baked beans and pork sausages for them, gave them a bottle of water and his spare blankets. While the food cooked, the girl helped the boy with his injured ankle. Then when it was ready, they ate and listened to the thunder outside. An hour later, the little girl was asleep after eating, and the boy was speaking with Josiah. He said his name was David, and her name was Primrose. When Josiah asked him who was the man that was chasing him, he said that he is part of the chorus of the void. They are a group of crazies, and that there are loads of them, and they worship the thing that rose from the ocean. They like to sing about it. He goes on to say that he and Primrose escaped from their commune, that they think he is special and they want to keep him captive. When Josiah asked him, why do they think you are special, he replied, I don't know. Josiah asked, what about Primrose? Why do they want her? And he said, they're grooming her to be a breeder. He then goes on to say that one of the men, Nash, helped them to escape because he had a change of heart and that they had arrived at this town this morning, but the chorus was close behind them. When the man told him to run and hide while he distracted them, but then he hurt his ankle 
and they got caught, and then Josiah arrived. Then David asked Josiah if he knew what happened to Nash. Josiah asked him if he was wearing a green coat. David said yes. Josiah said he didn't make it. They used their knives on him. Later, after David fell asleep, Josiah drank some vodka and had a difficult time sleeping because he kept remembering how he cracked the man's skull when he hit him with a crowbar. That night, Josiah had a nightmare in which Christ was on the cross being crucified and his squid bust out of Christ's head. When Josiah woke up out of the nightmare, the kids were against the other wall watching him, and David asked him if he was okay, and Josiah said he's fine, and Primrose told him you had bad dreams, and he said yes. She said, don't worry, we all have bad dreams now. Then David told him that they can't stay here, that there's a place called Fool's End that Nash told him about. It is further north, and it has on higher ground, and it's away from the floods and the chorus. Primrose tells him that they will find us here. They're very good at finding things. And Josiah said he can't let them go out there alone. So David said, come with us. But Josiah said, this place is safe. There's no reason to leave. David tells him, nothing is safe. There are no safe places. They will eventually track us down and take us. They'll kill you, Josiah, and it won't be a quick death. You said Nash didn't suffer, but I know you like to protect my feelings because the chorus doesn't believe in mercy for their enemies. If we stay, we will die. Josiah stepped out to have a smoke, and as he's standing outside, he thought he saw something come up out of the water at the end of the street and go back down. He went back in and made sure the door was locked, and as he's heading back to the storeroom, he heard a scream. When he got into the storeroom, he saw that David was having a seizure. Primrose was kneeling next to him. She had put a pillow under his head, and she told Josiah that this isn't his first seizure. When the seizure stopped, she asked him, what did you see? He said, I can't say, I won't say, I just want to forget. We don't have long left. Josiah tried to get David to tell him what he saw, but David refused, saying that if he tells it, it might come true. David then said, we need to leave. Josiah doesn't want them to leave. Then David said, we will stay here tonight, but we leave at first light. You can come with us or stay here, but whatever you choose, we are going. Josiah then tried to get Primrose to stay, but she refused since David said that he's protecting her. And Josiah said, fair enough, you made your decision. In the morning, I'll give you some food and water for the journey. And David said, thank you. And Josiah told him to get some rest. The next morning, Josiah watched as the kids left and disappeared in the rain. And then he went in and drank vodka until he passed out. When he came through, it was midnight. So he got up, grabbed his crowbar, put on his head torch, and left his stove and went for a walk in the warehouse. In the warehouse, he found that one of the side doors was open. And he looked and he saw footprints leading deeper into the warehouse. He heard a cry from inside the building. And he realized he wasn't alone. Then he shut and locked the door and followed the trail in the darkness. As he walked deeper into the warehouse, he heard a cry that then turned into laughter. It turns out that it was the man who he had hit with a crowbar, and someone had dug out his eyes. He looked like he had just come out of the grave, and he smelled like he had pissed and shit himself. He told Josiah that you shouldn't leave your doors unlocked. He said, my brothers took my eyes. This is my punishment for letting their children escape. But now time is up for you, and you are in some trouble now. That's when banging was heard on the outside of the warehouse doors. And the man laughed and said, my brothers are here. They're not happy you interfered, and they'll punish you for it. The man, who was blind, tried to attack Josiah, but fell over his feet. And then the warehouse doors busted open. And the man began laughing as Josiah fled deeper into the warehouse, so they turned off his head torch, looked back, and could see lights shining as the cultists entered with knives and torches looking for him. But in the dark, Josiah tripped and slammed into the metal shelving, and that alerted the cultists, and they began heading in his direction. So he did the only thing he could. He hid. While Josiah was hiding among the boxes and pallets, he was praying to God to get him out of this. He listened as the cultists found his storeroom and got hold of his supplies. He tried to get close to the door 
And when he was within 50 yards from the door, he ran for it. And that's when they saw him and began chasing him. He got out the door and ran for his life, not knowing where he was running, just running. He climbed over the fence and kept running. And they were chasing him. They were close behind him. The rain was falling hard and he kept running until he fell. And when he got up and looked back, he saw nothing. He was alone. He found a house and hid in it, worried about being caught. And he cried. He watched from the window as Squid went through the streets hunting. In the morning, he went back to the warehouse and found it deserted. All of his supplies were gone. And they had used the pages from his Bible to smear shit all over the walls of his den. His bed was soaked in urine and had ripped his clothes to pieces. They had even stolen all of his porn magazines. He came across the body of the blind man. They had cut his throat to the bone and had ripped off his genitals. He had been dead for several hours and they had tortured him. When he left the warehouse, he went through other houses in the area searching for anything that he could find to use. After about three hours, he had found two tins of baked beans, a packet of ready salted crisp, a cereal bar and Snickers, and a bottle of water. He also found a blanket, a change of clothes, and a new Bible, and a map on which he located Fool's End, where he intended to go. He had also found an axe that he would use for protection, and he knew he would need more supplies if he intended to follow the children. He went north searching houses as he went, keeping an eye out for survivors and looking for signs of David and Primrose. As he walked north, he came upon a church that was blackened and deteriorated, and he went inside. There were bones on the floor, human bones. The thought going through his head was, God is dead. Someone had desecrated the altar with blood and feces. And someone had painted on one of the walls a picture of Cthulhu with a bunch of squid around it. It looked as if it was reaching for him and the thought going through his head was God is dead and he began to cry. He found a back room in the church and that's where he went to sleep. He had nightmares of Cthulhu torturing nuns, holy men and saints. When he woke up he found himself on his knees before the picture of Cthulhu. He went outside and cried out for the squid to come and kill him, but they never came. In the morning, he continued north. All the lowlands that he was walking through was flooded. He came across a skiff that was resting on the side of a hill, but it was abandoned. There was nothing in it to scavenge. That's when a squid rose up out of the water. It was 10 feet tall, and it was looking at him. It came at him, and when it was almost on him, it screamed in pain. Josiah fell on his back as the squid screamed in pain. It turned, dove into the water, and swam away. That's when David appeared out of the mist. David told him, I knew you would come after us. I knew you would find us. When Josiah asked him what happened to the squid, it was going to kill me. David said, it won't return, not for a while. By then we'll be gone. Why didn't it kill me? Josiah asked. David said, I'll tell you when you reach the hiding place. The hiding place was an abandoned lorry. And after knocking, Primrose opened the door and let them in. Once they were in the trailer, David told Josiah that he told the squid to go away, that he's changing, he's becoming something else. He said he wasn't sure what he was becoming, but it's something that's not quite human. That's why we're headed up to Fool's End. Nash said they could help us. David goes on to say that he's connected to the squids somehow. He's able to scare the squid away just by thinking at it. Once again, Josiah's dreams was full of nightmares. Again, he saw Christ on the cross turning into a squid and attacking him. He woke up when the door to the trailer busted open and Primrose was calling out to David. The cult had found them and grabbed them and one of them knocked him out. When he came through, he was in a windowless room with no way out. Finally, after hours, two cultists came in to get him. One of them told him that they were going to see the bishop. When Josiah asked who, he was told, you'll find out. You'll find out lots of things, my little lamb. As they took him along past doors where he heard laughter, screaming, muttering, and chanting coming from, they took him upstairs into the higher floors and finally 
to a room that had double doors painted red and gold. The room was filled with antique furniture, thick rugs, medieval weapons, oil paintings, and mountain heads of exotic animals. They put Josiah to sit in a chair and another set of double doors open and a fat man came out. Josiah could see that there was something wrong with him, something inside him. He didn't know what. The man who was smoking a cigarette introduced himself as Bishop Fife. He said, welcome to Avalon House, Josiah. He told Josiah that he's been very helpful. He led them to the children. His men has been following him since he left Pendlebury. The man goes on to tell him that he used to be a Christian before all this happened, but now he's been awakened. And all of the things that he used to think of as sin and vices, he can now indulge them without fear of being punished. That in the reign of the great beast, we are free to be ourselves and discard all of the false piety and self-righteous bullshit. He goes on to tell Josiah that your God is dead, your religion is dead, your faith is nothing but ashes in the ruin of this world. He then offered Josiah to join his group, the chorus, but Josiah refused. Later, men came into Josiah's room and beat him unconscious, where he had another nightmare about Kusulu. Over the next days, the cult made him a slave. He would empty their latrines and do other tasks for them. He stunk, and most days they would beat him, and some days they would torture him both physically and mentally. The bishop would come down every so often and try to convert him, but he always refused. And finally, the bishop came down one last time and asked him to convert. When he said no, the bishop told him that tomorrow you'll be sacrificed on a wooden cross, just like a beloved messiah. After he left, Josiah fell asleep and dreamt of monsters. The next morning, they brought him out onto the grounds where a wooden cross was standing. In the rain, they stripped him, and as they began to put him on the cross, he noticed that Penrose was there watching. The bishop gave a little speech about how they tried to help Josiah, and he rejected them, and now he will perish either slowly or be taken by a squid in the night and that they are the chosen, they are the strong, and they will thrive in this new age of the great beast. The bishop came over and kicked him in the ribs. Then some men came and nailed his hands to the cross. They then used ropes to pull the cross into a vertical position and secure it in the ground. Then they left him there screaming until he passed out. Time passed. He was in constant pain. He tried to drink the rain. He would hallucinate and then he would pray for salvation or death. Then he would pass out. He woke up to something mewling below him, and he couldn't make out what it was, and the cross began to shake. Then the cross fell backwards. He screamed, and he passed out again. The next time he woke up, Primrose was standing over him, and she had a pair of pliers with which she pulled out the nails in his hands and cut the ropes from his hands. He told her that the cult will hurt her for this, that they will kill you. She said, no, they won't. Everything's changed now. You'll have to see. David saved us. Once he was freed, Primrose led him into the house, and the rooms and corridors and hallways was littered with bodies. He told him that it was David that saved them, that David was transformed, and then he escaped and killed everyone. He was so angry. She told him that he spared her, that he spoke to her inside her head and that he told her that it was just the beginning. He was the one that pushed over the cross and is out in the rain somewhere. They could hear David shrieking outside the walls. Pimrose tended to him, cleaning his wounds and feeding him. Every time he slept, he would have nightmares, but when he woke up, Pimrose would be right beside him and his body began to heal and they listened as David shrieked outside behind the walls. The day came when he could finally get up and move around. Although he was in great pain, he heard Pimrose's voice in the house somewhere, so he went looking for her. All of the bodies were already gone. He followed her voice into a sitting room where she was singing to David. David was in filthy clothes and his head was covered with a large hood. She told him that David likes it, when she sings to him, it helps him to sleep. He got her to take off David's hood so he could see his face. The lower half of David's face was covered with tendrils. 
each about eight inches long, and very little hair remained on his scalp. His skin was shredded with black veins, and beneath the tendrils, his mouth was filled with carnivore teeth. Pimus told him that part of him is still David. He's not fully gone. It's a gift from his ancestors, activated by the great beast's presence. When David opened his eyes, his eyes were still those of a little boy. Pimus told him that David wants to leave because when the squid return, he won't be able to hold them all back. She said they would go to fool's end. When Josiah said that he can barely walk, he won't make it, she said they won't be walking. The next day they hopped into a small wooden sailboat and headed north. While Josiah worked the till, David pointed out where they should go. All of the lowlands were flooded. Primrose told him that David didn't want to be alone until he was fully transformed. When Josiah asked what happens when he's fully transformed, she didn't answer. She told him that the water should take them all the way to fool's end. When he asked her, how does the link you have with him work, she said she don't know. She can hear his voice in her head, and then when he speaks in her head, she can also hear other things with him, like the screams of monsters and like people being tortured. As the boat headed north, it was passing by the taps of houses. Hours later, as they was passing by a flooded village, they saw a large squid, the largest one that Josiah has ever seen, come out of the water in front of them. David stood up and looked at the squid, and Pinrose told Josiah that they're speaking to each other. Then it dived back into the water and swam away, and Pinrose told him that the squid have eaten their fill, and now they're returning to the deep. They finally pulled up to a slope and disembarked, and Pimrose told Josiah that David knows where to go. And as they were walking through a road filled with rusting cars in the rain, David collapsed and began to whine and whimper. And then he finally stopped. That's when Pimrose told Josiah that he hasn't got long left. They finally got to Fool's End. It was a hamlet with no more than eight houses, a small community hall, and a church with one road. They followed David to the community hall. Inside, they found that the entire place was littered with human remains. Primrose told him that David said that these were the survivors. They were hiding here, safe from the squid, but something else happened. He knows who did it, but he won't tell. When they looked in the shadows, they saw what looked like a small child, another transformed child with tendrils that hung from its face. Pimus told him that David called them the cosmic spawn and that David said they should run. And David and the little creature attacked each other and began to fight. And as Pimus and Josiah ran, they saw that more cosmic spawn was emerging, coming to try and get a taste. They ran into the church and shut the door and waited for the cosmic spawn to come in. But when they didn't, Primrose told him that David is with them. Primrose asked Josiah if he thought that she would go to heaven. He said she's a good person, good people go to heaven. And then she asked if he will go to heaven, and he passed out. This time, Josiah didn't have a nightmare. He dreamt of peace at the end of the world with no more pain. When she woke him, you could hear a distant booming. When he asked what it was, she said the cosmic spawn are happy because the great beast is coming for them. Josiah then told Primrose that she has to leave. When she asked where would she go, he said anywhere but here. You have to go and survive. You could be all that's left. She began to cry and ask him, what about you? He said, I can't go any further. I have to face this thing. It's all I can do. Josiah gave Primrose all of the remaining supplies and she headed off into the mist beyond the village. And he prayed that she would be well, and he stepped out and looked at the cosmic spawn. And he saw them at the end of the road, and they were excited. And they vanished into the rain, and he followed. Followed them to the edge where the land met the flood waters. The cosmic spawn dove into the water and swam out towards the horizon. And out there, a distant towering figure emerged from the mist. It was the great beast. It was a primordial form, alien and obscene, Cthulhu. The cosmic spawn climbed onto it and bore it into its skin, and it came towards the shore. Josiah knelt holding his cross and began to pray, and he was clenching his jaw so hard that his teeth cracked. The great beast barely noticed him. It looked at him just once 
as it was going by. Josiah muttered the Lord's Prayer as the shadow of Cthulhu consumed him. And that is the end of the story, and that is the end of the book. I want to thank you for watching and listening. Subscribe if you haven't. Give us a like, drop us a comment, and I will see you in the next video.